to another truly inspiring episode of Dr. Kamini Rao's Masterclass. The fortunate thing about television is, of course, it is teamwork. It is an embodiment of teamwork, really. Any education really helps you formalize your thoughts, helps you present your thoughts. Doctors who are the you know, frontline uh, warriors that have actually laid down their lives to save the patients. No doctor wants their patient to die or wants to not be able to treat their patient. Whether you've had a good day, a bad day, a stressful day, whether it's been a tough day at the office, they are so happy to see you. There's so also there's no the evil. There's also no evil in a dog. They may fight other dogs if it comes for territory or for food or for mating, but there's always a reason. There's no, there's no question of not liking another dog because of the color of the dog's fur or the dog's caste or religion. They just, they, they, there's nothing evil in them. They're, they're very pure creatures. Absolutely. In fact, once you see a dog, you, you get so much of a stress buster with them that, you know, it sort of makes you understand and introspect. Why is it that, you know, uh, human beings can't behave like dogs? You know, why is there so much of trust deficit? And why is the world going in that kind of direction? And you start introspecting. And I have found many a time that people who have dogs in the house behave differently to ones that don't have dogs in the house. And, you know, you can actually look at people who have had dogs and they know what kind of empathy that they have. And this makes you know me wonder that do dogs teach us more than we teach dogs? And that's a, a point that I would like to leave with you because I know you you know it better than any of us here. But uh, that's that point. I just want to leave it with you. The other thing I wanted to ask you, Maya, is that you've been doing a whole lot of you know uh, very um, you know critical kind of uh, the, uh, coverage of news, like for example the Virapan and the Manglo crash that you did, the air crash. Now, what were the important, you know, human interest stories that you got out of this? Can you give us something? I remember when uh, the tsunami happened back in 2004, I was on duty that Sunday and I was attending a routine press conference, a press conference by Venkaya Naidu at that time. And then we heard that there had been a big wave that had hit Chennai. That was the first we heard about it. And we heard that people on the beach of Chennai had been washed away. Now, information was still coming in very slowly. This was before the days of uh, widespread mobile phones, before the days of social media. We were not yet sure what was happening, but we knew something bad was happening along the coastline, along the east coast of India. So we literally left. My camera person and I, we literally left. I, I remember buying some t-shirts or something along the road where our office was, and we just left towards Chennai, towards Pondicherry. And as we drove along the East Coast Road, towards Kadalur actually, which is one of the worst hit areas, we saw thousands and thousands of people walking in the night with their children, with their belongings, walking along the East Coast Road. And we didn't know clearly what was happening or the scale of what was happening. That came in later on. We thought a few dozens had been killed. But one thing I remember when I reached Kadalur, it was daylight. And we saw a man lying on an upturned boat, one of those small coracles. The boat was hundreds of feet inland. It had been washed in by the sea. And he was lying face down on the boat, sobbing and sobbing and sobbing. We assume that he has lost somebody. He may have lost all he had, his home, his property. But just that image of that man crying his heart out on that morning in Kadalur, on that upturned boat, it, it really brings home the human face of any such tragedy, the human face of really anything like that. We may see it at a news headline, but for the people involved, it is just so heartbreaking. On the Virupan story, I, I went in after people were kidnapped. He had kidnapped some people from Bandipur, from the actual, from the van itself and i went and i met the wife of one of the people who had been kidnapped and one can only imagine her fear her terror as to what was happening to her husband she was in a state of shock we just sat for a while i tried to try to give her some empathy some support but what she was going through he was fortunately released safely and they were reunited but that moment of fear of agony of the person going through it it, it is 
it goes beyond the headlines. Every story has so much emotion in it, which you may not realize when you're just watching it from outside. Absolutely. But, uh, you know, in fact, uh, I could also relate to something like that, Maya. You know, I went to Nagapatnam. Nagapatnam. Okay. You know, that was, you know, one of those affected areas. And I had gone into that uh, labor room in that uh, uh, mm-hmm. hospital there. It uh, was a small one. And I found that the walls in that labor ward, the water had reached up to eight feet high. And uh, one of the patients, who was a 42-year-old woman, was actually plastered against the wall. And you could see the blood splattered. She was into the second stage of her labor. And she was the blood was splattered against that wall. And the wet wall had actually you know, spread that blood. And I could just stand there completely struck. As an obstetrician gynecologist, I could not move. I just saw that. And then they explained that this was a 42-year-old woman. While she was delivering the baby with baby's head out and body inside, the wave just took her away and the obstetrician and that entire team into the water. And believe me, even today, if I think of it, you know, I get that cold impulse down my spine. I went and you know, brought everything that is required for that labor ward and then I went back. But I felt that, you know, we keep thinking that, you know, we will do this, we will do that. And, you know, it's a matter of just about two minutes to three minutes that that water came and went. But everyone's life had just gone. And I was wondering to myself, it was amazing. Even today, I can't get that thing off my mind. There was a woman... I know she hadn't got, though of course she didn't go through IVF or anything, 42 year old, Mm. had been married for approximately two years, but in delivery she was just pushed out. So I mean, you know, nature doesn't wait for anything, it just takes you away and that's it. And you know, that tsunami must have been a real eye opener for so many people and you know, you telling me this Maya, it sort of, you know, wakes up my mind on all these things. It's also a way we have to it's a reminder of how human beings have to reach out and help each other. Absolutely. You, you were there as a doctor, you were there as a doctor to help out. Uh, yes. The pandemic has again reminded us that we need to be there for each other. This is a time, Absolutely. this is not a time to turn on each other or see differences. We have to be there for each other. Yes. We have to have things. Absolutely. What about Virapan now, going across to this terrorist? Um, how did you cover that story and what did you feel about that whole thing? We covered this story really over many, many years because he was active. He came to public consciousness with the the terrible killings of some forest officers, some police officers. And then gradually the news began to spread because again, like I said, this was before social media, before everything was WhatsApped and uh, live television was everywhere. It was before that. So he gradually came into the consciousness of people, especially in Karnataka and Tamil Nadu and Kerala. And he began to develop an image that was larger than life. It was as if no force could catch him. There were, of course, all kinds of allegations about whether powerful people were actually backing him or not. That was there, but it was just so tragic as the so many people died because of him. So many elephants were killed by him. It, it was just a, a whole tragic example of what went wrong in terms of catching a man who killed dozens of people and seemed to get away with it year after year after year. There was a special task force that went in to look at him. The villagers were terrified because they were sort of caught between Virapan and his men and the officialdom as well. They were kind of caught in between. And it was a terrifying time for the villagers who lived there as well. For the animals, of course, it was the, for the elephants, it was terrible. And we used to go, we never knew. It was not a planned story. It was, that was really breaking news as you discussed breaking news earlier. We did not know when he would kidnap somebody, when he would kill somebody, when there would be a fresh poaching incident. It kept on happening. It kept recurring through the years to the unbelievably difficult time also when he kidnapped Dr. Rajkumar. For 100 days, he kept Dr. Rajkumar in custody, which is is something so unreal, which is something like out of a 
out of a film, out of some, out of a novel or something like that. The unbelievable difficulty of this much-loved man of Karnataka being taken and kept as hostage in the forest by Virapan. It was a constantly developing story. It was very challenging to cover because we didn't know when anything would happen. And of course, it wasn't very safe to go into the forest after him either. That was also a very difficult time. My husband was in fact part of the very first television team from Doordarshan who went in to do a story on Virapan and the team he was with. They helped him, they showed him around, he and his cameraman, they took shots. He came back and again, this was the era before mobile phones. After coming back, he learned that the team he had been with had been ambushed by Virapan and the men he had been talking to and chatting with just a couple of days earlier, they had been killed. That was the situation really, to go into the forest to report on Virapan was definitely not safe. And it was one of the most challenging stories for many of us journalists in Karnataka at that time. So were you able to face him at any time in life? Not in life, no, but when he died, when he died, we got the news late at night on the 18th of October, 2004. We got that news and we set off immediately. That was myself and another correspondent and two camera persons. We clambered into our OB van, that is a big van through which we brought broadcast live. We traveled overnight to Dharmapuri where he had been killed. There we saw the body of Virapan, the dead body of Virapan, we saw that. I never saw him in life, but I saw him in death up close. And it, it seemed very unreal also to find that this larger than life figure was lying there dead and that his story, his crimes you, were over it. It was a very strange feeling indeed. But do you think that uh, to an extent media was responsible to give him that larger than life figure? Um, not really. I would not hold the media responsible in that sense because what he was doing was was just impossible. Kidnapping people from a tourist bus in Bandipur, kidnapping the film star, killing forest officers, killing police officers. It was it needed to be reported because it needed to stop. And also remember in those days, there was not that kind of 24 hour nonstop television breaking news that there was earlier. There were limited media options. There were, of course, local newspapers. There were, of course, uh, local channels as well, which did do some coverage, which may have been seen to have been a bit sensational. But the fact of the matter is that news was sensational. What Virupan did was breaking news, uh, the real definition of it. I don't think the media did much of a role in making him larger than life. I think as a criminal, he was larger than life. He was such an, had such an enormous impact at that stage in the Southern States. But then when you looked at him, he really did not look like those usual big burly kind of characters. He looked a very nondescript person. What do you say, Maya? The very distinctive feature about him was his moustache, his massive Virupun moustache. That was a very eye-catching feature. But even that had been shaved off by the time we saw his dead body, that moustache was gone. So maybe like what we would say, um, the, the strength was all in his moustache, okay? Or the brains were all in the moustache or something like that. Because, you know, I feel uh, he was quite, um, what do you say, a wily person, thin, from what I see in the television uh, pictures, etc. He wasn't very fat or anything, that kind of a person. He could climb the tree very fast and he was very quick on his feet. Is that what uh, you had heard also? Yes, yes. I don't think he was a big or physically very powerful man, but of course he had to be tough in order to withstand that forest life. And he was Absolutely. very strong that way in terms of being able to have those rough conditions because they didn't live in luxury in the forest. They did have a very hard life and he did manage to live like that. And of course, with guns, if you have guns and weapons, you don't need to be physically strong yourself. Yes, so I'll just take you a little bit on to my subject, Maya. Now, we've got this ART guidelines and we've got surrogacy bill. Do you have any thoughts on any of this? Have you gone through any of it? Not in great detail, not in uh, great detail. It's I. I have a view which... Uh, What's your view? It's it's uh, maybe a very different view. I think if one wants to 
give love to a child uh it it may, it may be a little different because i i know you've been helping a lot of families make their dream come true of having a child but i i do think that if you want to love a child there are children there who need a home who need love so okay why don't you it adopt? may be a very different view it may be a different view like that yes okay but in fact many times when we ask them to get across to kara it takes more than 2 years to get a child and then there also you don't get a child now because it's so difficult for them to actually get a child because the adoption yes. agencies are also overwhelmed with the number of people seeking adoption and we are it, not it is, it is it is yeah it is yeah. very difficult many people have said it is a very tough and very emotionally draining process as well in order to actually get across and bring a child home but i i'm sure that ultimately it is worth it for them because the people who have brought children who have grown their families this way of course are extremely happy about this so no, uh, if you can yes, get believe me it is worth it it has to be simplified yeah the process has to be simplified it has to be made easier and it has to be made easier i think maya to. i fully agree with you it has to be made easier but it is so difficult for everybody you know you keep on having them you know go through the most private kind of these things get these foster people to go there and even when we give them letters you know they just don't do it easy and becomes very very you know embarrassing for these people so i feel that if the government can make it a little easier i think you know more people will come forward and take it Absolutely. two years is too long a time for a person who is 45 and I for think. the child also for, for, for a child, child as well children in, it's very difficult children in institutions with the best of will will not be able to get the same kind of attention the same kind of undivided yes. love the kind of care that they need in Absolutely. order to grow i mean so children in institutions it, it's the ideal place for a child is of course with a family and if the process is made simple i'm sure that many other families will actually adopt a child and grow their family that way i think many are frightened by the entire process and that way the government has to make it as simple and painless as possible now you've re- received so many awards maya i looked at all the awards but um, can you tell me which was the award that really made you feel very happy that this was the right oh, well, job that you got there you know any any recognition is really it makes you feel good it makes you feel good that people are actually looking at your work and all that but th- there are some of course which i remember more there was one which i got uh, from an animal welfare organization uh, it's it's a very cute little thing with a paw on it which says you are possum and i like to think that people who are working full time in the field of animal welfare feel that i have been able to raise a little bit of awareness that is very important Also the Karnataka Media Academy award I got for a film I did on Bangalore the changing face of Bengaluru the way it was the sleepy garden city the pensioners paradise to the IT paradise to the way it has changed and that was very very important to me as well in in that I also interviewed my father who was a quintessential bengalorian he was born here as well mm-hmm. uh, he was a writer Ramchandra Sharma and I spoke to him about the way he has seen the city change over the years and that was a program it was very important to me because i i love bengaluru i'm hurt by the way it is changing in some ways i know that i could not imagine living anywhere else in india but the city needs care it needs love so it was a very important film for me and i got the karnataka media academy award for best anchor for that particular thing that was also very important so each award which comes i i've got an award from a a group which is working in suicide prevention that is also very important to me So any recognition really is lovely. The Rani Kitto Chennamma Award for yes, women, that was so, so empowerment of women. That that was also lovely to get because if I maybe been able to help women think that they can do different things, that they can achieve different things, and I that was lovely to feel that if I've been able to let people know that, then that that feels good. Don't you think that every award puts more responsibility on you, and then the public? you know makes you accountable for what you've done and makes you sort of feel that they want more out of you yes it is because an award also brings focus on to 
your work and what you're doing and Absolutely. make sure that you, de- you deserve it for what you've been doing. And it also makes you introspect. It make, when you get something, you introspect and think, oh, wow, okay, so people have really been watching my work. They have understood it. They have appreciated it. Mm. Am I giving it all I can? Am I doing the best I can? It's really a reminder and an encouragement going ahead to make sure, Thanks. yes, that people are seeing what you do. It's important to maintain your standards, to keep those high standards. Don't let it slip because there is a tension. There is acknowledgement of your work and that should just make you work harder, more carefully, better. So Maya, you are such an inspiration to the society and to the youth today. Where do you draw your inspiration from and who is your role model? Oh, there there have been, of course, many people in life who uh, you look up to and you marvel at them, really. I, I think in many ways, my mother has been a huge influence on me. Uh, I think my love for animals comes largely from her. Her father also, this is way back at the early part of the 20th century in Mysuru. Her father also looked after dogs, loved dogs. So I think she got it from him and I got it from her. And animals have been such a huge part of my life. Plus also my mother's attitude and never getting defeated. I mean, she's still teaching. She's still teaching. She's in her 80s now. She gets the online classes set up for her. She still teaches. She loves her work. She always feels that if anything happens, which is a challenge, her attitude is, let's get on with it. Let's get on with the next thing. Let's just get things done. She is, has never been a person to take a negative view of things. And she believes that we need to be self-sufficient. We need to be independent. She has been a huge influence. And my father also was a very, very brave and adventurous man. He went abroad, he worked abroad, he came back, he basically made himself, he and my mother, they did not come from very privileged backgrounds or anything like that, but they worked very hard through their lives. They were very sincere in what they did. They had a value system. And my father also with his sense of humor and his intelligence and the way he spoke and his confidence and his charisma, I think it was wonderful. I think I've been very, very fortunate in my parents indeed. I would say they have been the biggest influences in my life. Excellent. So I think that, you know, you've given a lot of yourself and I'm sure there will be a large number of Mayas in the public today who've listened to you and who've been really sort of impressed with what you've said. And I would like you, in a nutshell, to talk to my viewers and say, what's there to learn from you in bullet points today and how do you face failures in life and how did you reach the goals that you have reached today with the awards etc and what kind of lessons do they learn from you so Maya your thoughts to the audience today wow that's lovely I'll have to again I'll have to think on my feet as if I'm doing a live report and try and (laughs) get some ideas together Uh, I I believe that uh, as I mentioned also earlier that we need to be kind to each other. We need to empathize with where the other person is coming from. We can't all be saints. We can't all spend our lives working in the service of others nonstop. We have to look after ourselves as well. But a certain sense of kindness, uh, understanding that if that person is different from me, it doesn't mean that person is wrong. If that person follows a different way of life, it doesn't mean that they are wrong and I am right. We used to have this old phrase in India, unity and diversity. We have to understand that people can be different, but we're all still people. If we can get that sense of understanding, and that is something my job has really helped me do because I go to all kinds of people. I go to all kinds of places and meet all sorts of people from different backgrounds. And that has really been an eye opener. We're all people at the end. How I've gone on, well, I I think I'm pretty persistent. I think that to have survived in this industry for over three decades. It can be an exhausting industry and there can be burnout. And many young people who join, I think after five or six years feel that they've had enough. But I have enjoyed the variety. The, I'm I'm curious by nature, I want to know things, which is a very good thing for a journalist. And in life as well, if you're curious about what happens next, what is behind this? What is the reason for this? I think that also helps a lot. I think it's very, very important to have a sense of gratitude for what you have. Any of us, even in a bad time, the very fact that we're here listening to each other, talking to each other, shows that we have had certain advantages in life 
certain ways in which our life has been better than millions of others. And we need to have that sense of gratitude and appreciation for what we have, what we have been given. That sense of gratitude, I think, is very, very important. I think you should have a sense of humor, really, to kind of understand, to make light of things when things are not that serious. Also to understand as well that sometimes when people are mean or nasty, it may come from a place of unhappiness in them. A happy person is not a mean person. If somebody is nasty to you or mean or sarcastic or putting you down, there must be something wrong in that person's life. So even though it's difficult, if you can find compassion for whatever they may be going through, it also helps not to take it personally when somebody is not nice to you. That sense of gratitude, that sense of living life in the moment because everything is temporary, everything will change. So we really need to appreciate where we are now, what we are doing now as much as possible. And in times of difficulty, this too shall pass. I think if we remember that, that this too shall pass, that we all suffer sorrow, we all suffer pain, that we're all in this human world together. And that by reaching out and finding each other, I think our own lives will become better. Thank you very much, Maya Sharma. That was a very interesting and informative session with you. I'm sure my viewers have had a lot to learn from you today. And it's been a pleasure interviewing today because normally you're interviewing all of us. But how did it feel being interviewed today? It is very, very interesting. And thank you for having me, for helping me with this conversation, really, because you asked me questions that made me think about my own life, my own self. And as you said, usually I'm on the other side. I'm asking the questions and not revealing anything about myself. But it was very nice this time to help me also examine my own thoughts. And I really enjoyed the conversation. Thank you so much Thank for touching you. on so many aspects which are very important to me, actually. Thank you. Thank you very much, Maya. So my dear viewers, that was Maya Sharma for you. And I'm sure you have enjoyed it as much as I have. So see you in the next session of Dr. Kamni Rao's Masterclass.